I was really into flying because I was finally making money and I had the company credit card. The motto of the Lord's Boot Camp was, get dirty for God, go lay a brick. So we learned lots of construction as well. And no matter which direction I look into, all I see are the Andy Mountains. They are enormous and truly majestic. Tonight's theme is Next Stop. This program is made possible in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. There is a saying that the only way to is through. And that is exactly what travel can do for us. By foot, by car, by train, by airplane, you can reach a new destination with a brand new perspective. You can literally change your own life. My name is Lorena Leonard, and I'm originally from Colombia. I migrated to the States 30 years ago. I have been in the communications field for almost two decades now. And you write a blog, I understand. Can you tell me a bit more about that? I do, yeah. So a little over a year ago, I decided to tell my story. It's been a burning desire that I've had for a long, long time. And so I finally made up my mind and started a blog called Greedy Girl. And in it, I tell stories about my upbringings, um, you know, growing up in adversity and how I overcame that adversity mm -hmm. uh, through grit and resilience. What made you decide to start telling stories on stage? It was the same desire that I think I want to reach um, women and young girls who may need to hear that others have been in their similar situations, that mm -hmm. they can overcome their circumstances. And so that desire led me to seek out an audience. Tonight's theme is next stop. Mm -hmm. What does that theme mean for you? Well, for me, it's a very heavy theme because uh, as an immigrant, the next stop for me was the United States. You know, it was a long journey, but it, it was an opportunity for me to become the person that I am today. A decade after buying our home, my husband and I finally decided to remodel our 1970s bathroom. Now, I've just given birth to our second child, and as if I didn't already have enough on my plate, I eagerly volunteer to manage the entire project. Besides, the contractor assures us the whole thing will only take four weeks to complete. Well, <laughs> four weeks turned into nine very long weeks, but in the end, we got the beautiful bathroom we wanted. So here I am, standing in my newly remodeled bathroom, admiring the genius of my design the eye-catching sapphire blue tile, the elegant waterfall faucet, the ultra-modern dual flush toilet. But my favorite is the medicine cabinet, which is covered in mirrors inside and out. This thing is stunning. Looking in the mirrors, I'm surprised to find myself overcome with emotion. My throat tightens, my heart beats faster, and I'm welling up with tears as memories transport me back to my childhood. It is the 1980s in Medellin, Colombia. Medellin is a large city, nestled in a valley within the Andy Mountains. And I live in the suburb of the city in what feels like a pigeon coop with my parents and two younger sisters. The living conditions in our tiny apartment are dire. For instance, our electrical wiring is a catastrophe just waiting to happen. We have exposed live wires that hang from the ceilings and creep down the walls like vines of poison ivy. Our semi-functional bathroom has no door, no sink, and no medicine cabinet. And our toilet has no tank, which means we have to fill up a big bucket of water to flush it. And hot water is a luxury we can't afford, so I take icy cold showers every morning before school. The place is also infested with vermin. We have a mouse nest in the closet, but the baby mice are actually really cute, so I beg my mom to keep them, but she doesn't. And at night, I am creeped out by the cockroaches I hear flying above my head. Yes, they fly. Since we're on the top floor, we have a terrace where I spend a lot of time hanging out to staring into the distance. And no matter which direction I look into, all I see are the Andy Mountains. They are enormous and truly majestic. Strangely, the view makes me feel claustrophobic. I am surrounded and I can't escape. There is unspeakable violence happening outside my door. The infamous drug lord Pablo Escobar and the drug cartels are spilling blood everywhere, but there's no one to turn to because there's corruption at every level. 
Crimes against human rights are taking place every day. Children are recruited to become killers. People are displaced. Some are disappeared. Many are tortured. And the murder rate keeps climbing. One afternoon while I was outside riding bicycles with my younger sister and our friends, we heard gunshots. We ran as fast as we could and we hid at the entryway to my apartment and shut the door behind us. But I quickly realized that my sister wasn't with us. I felt tremendous pressure on my chest as if I were being crushed with stones and I could hear the blood pulsating in my head. Instinctively, I pushed the door open and I ran out to find her. She was standing in the middle of the street straddling our bike. She was all alone and looked absolutely terrified. When I got to her, I wrapped my scrawny arms around her as if I could somehow shield her from what was happening. A man with a gun came running toward us. He was so close, I felt a breeze as he sped past us. Not long after this incident, I'm woken up by a deafening sound. The blast was so loud, it shattered the window of my bedroom. I was really scared, but I ran out to the terrace anyway with my parents to find out what was going on. The sun hadn't even come up yet, but all of our neighbors were outside too, and they looked just as distressed as we were. Later that day, I learned that a car bomb had exploded in a very wealthy neighborhood not very far from where I live. The bomb, which was an attempt against Pablo Escobar, was so powerful, it was felt within a three-mile radius, and it left a huge crater on the ground. This bombing set into motion the most violent time Colombia has ever seen. Around the same time, I also learned that my grandfather was trying to help my family migrate to the States. You see, my grandfather fought in the Korean War for the American Army, and as a veteran, he was granted U.S. citizenship and had been living in the States for many years. His status would help us apply for residency. So to cover the cost of the visa applications and to make the trip from Medellin to Bogota, where the U.S. Embassy is located, my grandfather sent us a few hundred dollars, which my mom kept hidden in an armoire. One day we came home and found the place a complete mess. Somebody had broken into the apartment and had taken many items, including the money we were saving for our visa applications. But miracles do happen. Somehow, we raise the money again, and we are all granted U.S. visas. It is now 30 years later, and I am back in my beautifully remodeled bathroom, and I realize I've been crying. But my daughter doesn't notice. She's been sick with a cold and is now complaining about a headache, so I quickly compose myself and I reach inside the medicine cabinet to find the children's ibuprofen. I take her into her bedroom and I cuddle her to sleep. And in this moment, I feel immense gratitude that my daughters are growing up in a very different world. But I question whether I'm being too overprotective. I'm constantly shielding them from the dangers that lurk every day. You know, scraped knees, hurt feelings, catching a cold not from shootings as I once did with my younger sister. I think about their future, when the time will come for me to tell them these stories and how our family finally broke free from the violence. And no matter how much I try to shield them, the world's hardships will find them. I wonder, what will my daughter see in this mirror when they are all grown up? Thank you. Coming to the States, you know, as an immigrant, um, really as a refugee escape in war, and we had nothing, we came with nothing. And to go through this journey where I had to fight with tooth and nail to get to where I am today, to be able to uh, be in the beautiful home that I am today um, and have the opportunity to remodel my bathroom and choose this gorgeous medicine cabinet, it, it, it speaks to that fight and the struggle and how resilient I had to be and the grittiness that I had to build to acquire um, a better life. My name is Kelly Dunham. I live in Brooklyn, New York. I'm originally from uh, rural Wisconsin and I'm a nurse and I work in the New York City public school system. So I understand that in 2015, you were a nominee for the White House Champion of Change Award. 
um, and that that came from your work with a program called Queer Memoir, which you founded and you're the co-producer of. So, that, yeah, Queer Memoir, I started it in 2010, January 2010, um, myself and Jenny Murphy, who's a playwright. And we're like, you know what, let's just bring together some people, some people who are performers and some people aren't. And uh, we had it in this very underground performance space. And like 115 people came and there wasn't even any room. It was literally somebody's apartment. And people were just so hungry for those kind of stories. It was just when there was starting to be more LGBT stories in the mainstream. And they weren't told by us, right? They were told by other people. And, you know, if you let somebody else tell your story, they repackage it in some, you know, uh, messed up way and sell it back to you. Mm -hmm. But we just wanted to have... Uh, LGBT folks telling their own stories in their own words. And one of the most amazing things about it is that most people, when they are working on their story, they come to a conclusion that maybe they wouldn't have if they weren't going to tell their story, mm -hmm. right? It adds meaning to whatever it is that they went through. Um, and then that's like, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. When I was a teenager and other folks my age were drinking wine coolers, it was the 80s, and making out in the back of their friend's borrowed Camaro. I was going to church three times a week and asking complete strangers, um, excuse me, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior? I was a very fervent born again Christian, which made my very fervent born again Christian mom very happy. But I was also, as you can see, a lifelong tomboy. And that made my fervent born again Christian mom very sad, or at the very least, super worried. I came home from school, it was a spring day, my sophomore year of high school, and I found on the kitchen table uh, a folded piece of paper. My mom had written on it, this looks like something you'd love, exclamation point. Uh, and I opened it up, and uh, it was for the Lord's Boot Camp Missionary Training Program. And it was full of these smiling teenagers and they were physically building churches and they were asking total strangers, excuse me, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior? And I thought, this does sound like something I'd love. <laughs> Once I'd made the decision to do it, I only had three months to raise a $1,200 uh, that was a participation fee. At first that seemed really daunting, but then somewhat inexplicably, all the adults at church really got behind me and they let me uh, do a car wash on Sunday mornings and sell popcorn after Wednesday night Bible study, and they even made me cookies to sell at a weekly bake sale. In the brochure, it said that the Lord's Boot Camp was, quote, no pamper camp. When we arrived at the Lord's Boot Camp, we found that, boy, howdy, they were not kidding. Uh, it was essentially an unchanged Florida wetland we slept in these tiny little tents that were so covered in mildew they looked like the side of like a Guernsey cow. <laughs> we were supposed to clean up in this kind of swampy pond thing that they completely unironically called God's bathtub. <laughs> it was attached to a drainage ditch where two alligators lived. <laughs> now when we asked our leaders about it, their response was, now do you really think, do you really think that an alligator is gonna eat 500 teenagers? <laughs> I mean, I don't think any of us thought 500. <laughs> but isn't even one kind of a lot? <laughs> Every morning at five, we ran the Lord's Boot Camp Obstacle Craning Course. And it was a bunch of biblically named physical challenges that our leaders said would help us develop the personality characteristics that it would take to survive as a missionary. The first obstacle was called the Children of Israel's Luggage. <laughs> and it was a whole bunch of decommissioned wooden artillery boxes they were filled with sand, nailed shut, and then they had painted the name of a book of a Bible on the side of each box. We approached them, they'd be all in a heap, and then somebody from your team would go, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and everyone would scramble to put them in the order found in the books of the Bible. The last obstacle was a series of six-foot walls 
that were painted with the names of sins that we would have to get over <laughs> in order to serve Jesus. <laughs> it went pride, gluttony, greed. And then the last wall was name confusion. So the motto of the Lord's boot camp was, get dirty for God, go lay a brick. So we learned lots of construction as well. <laughs> I learned how to hammer nails without hitting my thumb and saw a straight line. Uh, and I learned how to tie rebar and lay bricks and mix cement by hand. So obviously, I was kind of having a great summer. <laughs> I mean, it was a whole summer of being a tomboy. Now the only thing that I didn't super love, it just seemed kind of random, was every afternoon they split us up by genders and the boys went to a class called God's Gentlemen. And according to the boys, what they learned was mostly about how to attract a Christian spouse. Uh, mostly that was choosing the right activities, like sports were a good idea and theater, not so much. <laughs> the girls group was called From Grubby to Grace. And it was mostly about being ladylike and grooming. There was a whole section on makeup, and it started with a quote from the Lord's Boot Camp founder. It said, if the barn looks better painted, why not paint the barn? <laughs> so except for that kind of random, and somewhat, I guess, now that I think about it, misogynistic, <laughs> afternoon class, I, I, I had a great summer and I returned home with this newfound zeal. I also had a new haircut. So I had a spiral perm that I tried to bleach blonde with actual bleach. And after six weeks of washing it in swamp water, it was so matted I couldn't even get a comb through it. So one of my team members kindly offered to shave off everything but a little bit on top and on the sides but she left me with a four inch rat tail in back because it was the 80s and I looked great. <laughs> I also had all these newfound muscles from all our hard physical labor building God's kingdom. So I dragged, as you can imagine, my extremely smelly backpack onto my mom's front porch. And I said, mom, don't I look like a new creature in Christ? And she said, you look a lot the same. And she had a little tear coming out of her eye and I thought, oh my God, that's so sweet, she really missed me. I've been an out queer person for 20 years and I've been telling this story socially to illustrate what it is to be a born again Christian teenager. I did not know until last summer when I was Googling the Lord's boot camp, I wanted to show my girlfriend a picture of the obstacle course. I didn't know which you guys already probably have an idea. So I haven't confronted my mom about this. Uh, and it's not just because she's 86 and she has realized that my tomboy swagger and my girlfriend are here to stay, even though that's true. <laughs> and the final reason I don't bring it up with my mom is because I spent an entire summer learning how to use power tools. <laughs> so the summer that was supposed to make me less of a lesbian just made me great at picking up other lesbians. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Angie Chapman, and um, I'm originally from Chicago but I live now in Watertown, Massachusetts, which is a town outside of Boston. And I'm a writer and editor. And I guess I can now call myself a storyteller. Can you tell me about how you got started with telling stories? Yeah, so a friend tricked me into taking a class called Pitching Stories. And I knew that as a writer, I would need to pitch my stories if I wanted to get published. Sure. And so I went to the class and it was fun and really um, enlightening. Does it take a lot of courage for you to get on stage and does it make you scared? Oh, heck yeah. I'm nervous as I'll get out. But I was telling somebody else who had never told stories. It gets addictive and what gets addictive is not the telling so much, but 
being in a crowd where everybody's listening to your every word, it's such a rush. So are there any themes that you tend to find um, come out in most of the stories that you're telling? Oh, yeah. And, and that's really funny how it's recurring because mm-hmm. I didn't expect that. Um, but yeah, always it, it comes back to race. Mm. Um, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. And so that was the defining issue for my time growing up. I mean, I, and I grew up in Chicago, too. So one of the things that I um, continually heard in my household, I mean, one of my uncles was the same age as Emmett Till, mm. you know, so and then Chicago's so segregated and it's just all those things. So it, it comes back to race. Remember the days when traveling was fun? Before you could only carry three ounces of liquid in your carry-on? Before you had to take your shoes off and put them in that gray plastic bin? Before you had to hold your arms up in the diamond shape to be scanned and pray that you didn't also have to be felt up by TSA agents? When I graduated from graduate school, I was really into flying because I was finally making money, and I had the company credit card. (laughs) I volunteered for every necessary business trip I could. Does anybody want to staff a trade show in Las Vegas? I do. (laughs) Angie, we need somebody to go talk to the client in Los Angeles. Okay, I'll go. And how about a training session in the new software upgrade in Phoenix? Yes, just tell me when. The problem was is that I was based in upstate New York. And the good news is that I had to connect through Chicago's O'Hare Airport because that's my hometown. And pre-9-11, you can actually leave the airport in between layovers. And so I would leave, and my mother would drive up from the south side um, in her home and pick me up, and we'd go out to breakfast for pancakes. So I'm on my favorite flight one time, um, the red eye from LA that leaves at 11.30 and gets into Chicago at 6 a.m. And I'm curled up under the blanket with my book, you know, just chilling with the overhead light. And the seatbelt light goes on and the pilot comes on and says, we expect turbulence. And I'm like, no big deal. I've taken this flight before. But you know how you can smell somebody else's fear? (laughs) And it's not Chanel. That's what I was sensing from the woman next to me. And I look over, and she's a white girl, and she has a nice red ponytail, and she has freckles sprinkled all over her nose. And the reason why I could tell is because her face was so pale with fear. And so I look over to her, and I said, are you okay? And she says, we're all going to die, aren't we? (laughs) And I'm like, no, we're not going to die. And she looks back at me, and she's like, how do you know? I said, because when we land safely, I'm meeting my mother for pancakes. (laughs) And she laughed too, and it gave me that warm feeling like when you see a baby crying and so you make funny faces till it stops. (laughs) So I go back to my book and the plane bounces again. And now she's gripping the armrests really, really tight and doing those deep breathing exercises. So I put my hand over hers on the arm west, and I say, what's your name? And she says, Amanda. And I say, oh, Mandy. And she says, it's Amanda. (laughs) I'm like, okay, Amanda, where are you from? I'm from Appleton. Where is that? She says, it's in Wisconsin. I said, I know it's in Wisconsin, but is that near Milwaukee or Madison? And she says, it's up by Green Bay. And I said, oh, dear. And she's like, what? And I said, I'm a Bears fan. (laughs) And again, I got that laugh, like the baby stopped crying. And I'm like, this really feels good. I um, go back to my book, though, but this time when the plane hits turbulence, it's so bad, I feel it. And so what happens, instead of laying my hand on hers on the armrest, I actually intertwine my fingers with hers. And I just continue to ask her inane questions to keep her talking. And while she's doing that, I'm looking at her hands intertwined like a Benetton commercial for black and white unity and understanding. (laughs) And I realize that I have never held hands with a white person before. (laughs) 
I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and so even though my school was not segregated, the nuns had us line up on opposite sides of the wall, and we were not allowed to touch. And even though the loving decision made interracial marriage legal across all 50 of our states, laws may change, but customs do not. So I never had a white boyfriend walk me from the library to the dining hall in college. I wonder if the same happened with Amanda, but I didn't ask her. Instead, I kept on the inane conversation until we landed safely. And when we did, Amanda grabbed her carry-on from underneath the seat in front of her and ran down the aisle without even saying goodbye. I took my time getting my carry-on out of the overhead compartment and I walked down the aisle and then to the jetaway. And when I got out into the waiting area, there was Amanda, her hand outstretched. And so I walked up to her and I shook it. And she said, thank you. And I said, go Bears. <laughs> and she said, always a cheese head. <laughs> and we went our separate ways. I don't know where Amanda went. I never saw her again. I went to go get a stack of pancakes. Thank you. This program is made possible in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.